Hey folks, and welcome back. I'm making a video. Yes, you can see this, but we're doing this live on Twitch. Hi, if you want to watch twitch.tv slash luncheon. Today, we're going to be talking about a few of the concepts that I have for Legendary Hero remixes coming whenever for that reason. Luckily, for whatever reason, the last data mine that just came out for the last update confirmed that the next two remixes are going to be Gunthra and Ryoma. I'll have one of those covered with the batch of four that I have going on so far, but Ryoma will have to wait for a while. We're going to be talking about Harid, Gunthra, Legendary, Hector, and Lin. These are all going to be like my personal sort of preferences with this sort of stuff, what I think would work at least relatively nicely for them. I'm not always the best when it comes to at least conceptualizing some stuff, but I can at least understand what it's like to try to at least make stuff better. I don't know, with at least a little bit of a background in looking at some esports, understanding game balance and that sort of stuff. And, you know, at least having a good understanding of this game, I'm sure I could at least have a little something, maybe throw a little something away. I don't know. Hi, YouTube. Hi, Koopa. All right, let's get started. And hopefully, hey, transition. Wow. All right. Hi, I'm over here. I'm down here. You see me? There you go. So, uh, yeah, I hope you like the graphic. All right. So first up, we have got uh, Harid. Now, what I have here, because I don't fully know what's going to happen. All we know for now, because of Ike and Fjorm, they only did some skill upgrades and enhanced their specials. So I don't know what the hell they're going to do about their preferred skills and or their weapons. I have no idea what they're going to be touching. So I basically have it so that I've made a change to their weapon, a change to their skill and a bonus skill that they're going to get and inclusion just so I'm covering all the bases so I can just, you know, have something figured out for them. And we honestly just go from there <laughs> that right. All right. So for his weapon, Gil, uh, it's the same more or less. It's well, if a negative status effect is active on foe, he'll make a guaranteed follow up attack and the foe cannot. The part that I added was not follow up. Neutralizes effects that guarantee full follow-up attack and effects that prevent units follow-up attack during combat. I find that when it comes to Harid, at least as just a sword cavalier as is, he kind of sucks. Not necessarily that I think he's bad. I think he's okay with what he's able to do, being a sword cavalier that can do some really weird things based on the debuffs of enemies. I think that's cool. My problem is that it's really hard to really work around with him only just so because he's an older legendary unit and he doesn't really stand out or at least the thing that makes him unique doesn't necessarily work for him nowadays. He needs a little bit more, especially when it comes to there being a lot of units, especially armor units in particular, that have a lot of follow-up negation and that sort of stuff and just messing with that sort of stuff and the fact that he wouldn't be able to get off his auto follow-up based on you know people just canceling out his follow-up it kind of hurts especially when he has very pitiful speed but at least he has a good amount of stats everywhere else which is nice so i thought that at least having null follow-up at least in his weapon it makes sense. It's just like a simple and honest thing to do, in my opinion. And it goes a long way to make sure that he can at least be consistent with the combat that he needs to do. I mean, if he's going to be getting a guaranteed follow up, you might as well make sure that he can do that almost all the time and not make it be, OK, this can maybe happen sometimes because this unit can negate his follow up or whatever. No, this is going to go on basically every single time unless there's some other word stuff and make it a speech i don't know it's just weird but i think this will make his combat at least a little bit more consistent but now when it comes to his per skill this has always been a weird one the uh the seals just because of how they impact people at times so it, it, it's really weird i i really didn't know entirely what i wanted to do with this i didn't want to make it super broken or anything like that but i think this still works out fine at least in my opinion so what I made the change of is, well, I'll just read it out first. A sort of turn inflicts uh, attack, speed, and defense minus six on foe uh, on the enemy team with the lowest res through its next action. So really the only thing I did there was, I believe I just added on, I okay, I'm gonna be honest, at this rate, I don't remember what the hell I added. This is the point where I actually need to look 
Because I what it is is that I added in one of the stats that he now debuffs. Uh, simply because... Oh, yeah, I added in the defense, I think was what it was. I added that in just for more consistency. Because for whatever reason, his skill wanted to hit on defense, or res, sorry. Which I find really weird in this case, at the very least. It's like, there could definitely be some things that could change here. And I think that at least adding on the defense is fine. I think it just makes it so that he can at least do... Well, mainly, I mean, it's giving him uh, basically virtually six more attack that he can do to the target that he would be going at if he goes at the target that was hit by his seal, which I honestly don't hate. I think that if I wanted to do anything to maybe make this a little bit more consistent or a little bit more meta viable, I think what I would maybe do is make it so that it's the same, the same stat debuffs that I have going on, but not have it hitting on the res, but rather I could have it so that it affects the person who was in uh, the closest to him within however many spaces. Basically do what basically happened with Morgan and whatever debuffers like Solon, for example, basically hitting on the nearest unit within four or five spaces. Doing something like that, I think, would make things a lot more consistent, at least with his debuffs and his target prioritization. It doesn't feel half-assed at that rate, at least in my opinion. And then lastly, for the skill that I gave him, I decided, like, well, he already has attack smoke as is. And besides that, he's got Moonbow, Disencounter. He doesn't really need anything he needs to really replace. So I thought maybe just doing a little upgrade to his C-slot would work out. And that's why I have Panic Smoke there, because I feel like Panic Smoke would be a lot nicer to have around in his kit, mostly just because I think it just allows the option that if he's going in to attack somebody, or at least going into a team, I think that it's okay to have him inflict Panic on everybody else around, because if they end up having bonuses that show up, Hey, you're panicked. You can't do anything about it. You're just getting debuffed. And I'll just, again, it'll make sure that he can activate his weapon, which I think is really the whole thing that I'm trying to tie together with this, making his combat and his auto doubles a lot more consistent. And I think that's fine. It's not like the whole idea of remixes aren't to make it so that a unit is broken or whatever. I think it's more so that I just want to make things a little bit more consistent for the niche and i think that's kind of what you're trying to do with these units all right next up we've got gunthra again sort of the same ish idea as harid just a little bit more like personalized because her weapon isn't necessarily an auto follow-up it's basically um it's hitting on debuffs on the well, it's basically a reverse blade someone it's hitting on an enemy's penalties I'm not gonna listen to that. So the changes that I made to Blizzard aren't really that noticeable, only because, in a way, I feel like it didn't really need to change, at least in my opinion, because I I've seen gun throws before. At least I haven't seen too many, but the fact that she can do some really weird things with having, basically, like I said, a somewhat reverse blade tome. You can do. You can basically just debuff your enemy, and if they're hit for a good amount, you can do a ton of damage at that rate, along with other stuff that you can do to mess around with her kit. So, the only thing I really added here was just making it so that if a, neta, if a negative status effect is active on the foe, uh, she'll get plus three to all stats during combat, which I think is fine. Especially when it comes to her offensive stats, they're kind of eh. I believe she has, what is it, 31 or 33 base attack. It's one of those two. And she has speed that she can work with, but this will just help it work out a little more, I think. And I think just being able to have, again, the weird reverse, uh, I'm just going to call it the reverse blade tome, and as well as just plus read all stats during combat, just makes things a little bit easier for her to work around with. And I think that's okay. But now when it comes to Chilling Seal, it's literally just what you find with a raid just switch around the defense and res and you've got the same thing the same thing that i said before when it comes to freezing style uh applies for chilling seal so there's something really new there otherwise uh when it comes to her skill i i'm gonna be honest game press kind of screwed me over with this one i originally wanted to give her steady impact because i thought it would have been nice to negate uh incoming follow-up attacks from the enemy 
but then for whatever reason game press doesn't have it so that it actually shows that hey cavalry units can't actually get impacts by the way or at least it's been packed so great i decided instead i would just give her attack rate solo four just because i feel like it just it's fine she's a cavalry unit so she's gonna have three movement aka she's most likely just gonna be away from her team and not adjacent to anybody so i think it'll be okay that she can at least proc this uh offensive skill here i didn't want to do anything with attack and speed because i feel like that would have been weirder or at least i didn't want to really make it so that her offensives could be easily greatly impacted just because of hey like you're already going to have insane damage output with her as is so by having that i feel like that's okay at least i tried to find a compromise at the very least i feel like i couldn't get the best of the compromise i wanted but i think this is okay it'll help her at least tank more uh magical uh enemies as well because surprisingly her resistance isn't actually that high at least compared to other mages that you would expect especially for a uh, gen 2 legendary unit that's also a mage calf so being able to give her some extra res while also i guess patching up her attack a little more it works i guess i think what i would have rather have done in this case as well was i would rather have a speed res solo four instead but i didn't want to give her a skill that doesn't currently exist yet and even now still doesn't exist so i'm kind of just like I, I, i'm in a weird position with that one but that's just me it's really weird to see her in arena due to low bst stuff that is very true but i think one thing that will actually help her is the fact that they're actually doing cavalry four skills and that will still help her even if a le she's a legendary unit she'll go from having being in like the 140 ish 145 i think bst bin right because she has like 140 something towards 150. so upping her to 175 is going to help out a lot and it still gives her a bit of extra bonus stats at that case like you don't necessarily need to run attack speeds or attack res solo here again she has already nice damage output that you can play around with her with her and just hurting people with a blizzard tome and again chilling seal i don't think it actually because i think at this rate if you are also going to be upgrading these skills as well you would probably want to make sure that they're also on par with other personal skills that they match the same uh like a uh, skill cost or scoring whatever you cost like the, the sp to uh inherit the skill or at least to learn the skill that should be on par with other ones so that she doesn't have to have so much to get the max scoring that she can possibly get or at least well that'll help her get there is what i mean so i i think overall this works out for what needs to be done it's not the most insane, but at least for a unit like Herc, who can already do some really weird things with Blizzard Tome, I think it's okay. I don't know, you'll have to let me know in the comments what you guys think. Next up, we've got Hector. Um, Hector and Lynn are somewhat in the same position in, in terms of, I wanted to keep, again, I want to keep their consistent playstyle at least. What makes said unit unique? Uh, even if it doesn't really follow through with how the game is nowadays. So I want to at least retain what made them unique, but make sure that, you know, it, it at least feels like it can thrive in the game today. So for Thunder Iron Rads, I actually don't remember what I did here entirely. I, I just want to pull up what the uh, thing is first. Uh, well, I'm going to read it out. So, yeah, grants plus three defense. If number of allies within two spaces, excluding unit, is greater than the number of foes within two spaces, excluding target, inflicts minus attack and six defense on foe during combat, and foe cannot make a follow-up attack. So, oh yeah, all I did was really just give him the, uh, the minus attack and, uh, minus six attack and defense during combat. Okay. Yeah, again, like, it didn't feel like it was a bad effect. It basically made it so that the foe couldn't make like a follow-up attack just by, you know, having more, you know, like you're basically wanting to be around your units, which makes sense. He's an armor unit. He's not going to be going off wildly wherever. He's not like Edelgard, for example. So being able to at least make things a little bit easier for him to work around, at least giving him some more uh, buffs, at least in some regard, in the combat, uh, based on, you know, fulfilling his condition, it makes sense and i mean based on how many units have minus six attack and defense during combat and stuff like that i think this just makes sense honestly it's nothing too crazy and realistically this is something they could do if they went in that direction 
Now, Osteo's Pulse is a very interesting one, I will say. Mostly because... Well, let, let's just be honest. It, it's not like it's bad or anything like that, but I wanted to make it a little bit more unique. And it still reaches something that is fairly unprecedented, actually, so far. So, at the start of one, grant special cooldown minus one to all allies. And this is in general, at that rate. Like, I think what it was before was that this was restricted to tactics. I just got rid of that completely. Like, you... Like, when it comes to tactics right now, in the current landscape of the game, they're basically unheard of, let's be honest. So, getting rid of that restriction, I think it's fine. And even if they did just that, and maybe, like, did something else a little bit more, like, how, if they even wanted to do something like, I don't know, like, grant special cooldown minus two to all allies or something like that, or something in that regard, maybe even do something like Pen, where you make it a, uh, just within two spaces of Hector, like, grant special cooldown charge minus two for you know within two spaces something like that i don't know it's whatever you want to do but the second effect i thought was really interesting at that rate i give it so that he inflicts special cooldown charge plus two on target after combat no effects on special cool special cooldown counts already at maximum so what i wanted to do was that if he doesn't actually end up killing anybody during a round of combat which at least for Hector, it's possible that he might not kill, but it's mostly, I guess at that rate, it's going to be on targets that will probably kill him, at, but at the same time, I, I don't know, it's something. Either way, it's basically like a targeted pulse smoke, but it hurts even more. I think that giving cooldown charge plus two is going to help, at least in making sure that this unit, if they are able to survive the combat, they won't be able to go back at you and kill you with their special. No, you're getting punished for not being able to kill him. You're going to lose your special very gravely. So it's just like, there you go. If you don't kill Hector, you're getting punished. Simple as that. And that's kind of the intention. You probably won't end up killing him as easily because one, your follow-up attack is already getting negated. And two, you're not going to be able to damage him as much because... Well, he's going to do more damage to you at least a little bit, but you're not going to do as much damage to him as well. So, yeah, I, I feel that works. And as for the skill, it, I also find that it kind of works out in this case. It gives him actually some very good variants as well. I give him Crafty Fighter mostly because one, it'll still give him an auto follow up where it matters, especially to make sure that it still works with Thunder Armas because duh. But also, it'll still give you the variances if you want to accelerate your own special or make sure that the opponent isn't going to be able to get their own special either. Just further making sure that no specials are getting charged like at all from your enemy. So again, if you survive the combat, even if they have something like if they even have like a bold fighter, for example, like they're probably still going to get the, you know, just the one and then one and then one, they're not going to be able to get it uh, like even further than that. Because again, special cooldown charge plus two after the combat, if you don't kill him, so it's kind of just like he's making sure that he's not dying to specials at that rate. And at that rate, he's going to do his best to kill you. And he probably will kill you at that rate. But this is more as a safety net for making sure that he won't die himself. And I think that works out because comparing it to other axe armors that have come out recently, that sort of fit his role in being a very team oriented tanky green armor. When you compare him to Mamri, he's she just has a like at least some more stats, but also her weapon just makes sure that she has a lot of extra defensive stats to make sure that she survives most round of combats just because of who like how people are attack her during the phase. So how do you give Hector that same sort of uh like combat similarities, but also making sure that he has some variance? And I think that by making sure that you just make things a little bit simple for him. Sure, just giving him the, the debuff on the enemy. You can do that, sure. But I think that being able to reduce the cooldown charge for people in combat is going to be so damn nice and just punishing people. It gives him a very unique playstyle that I find that has actually worked out for my Mamadi recently as well. Whenever I use her, it's usually just a slap fest where neither her or the enemy are really killing each other. And it just comes down to who ends up having more specials, specials charged down and takes out the other. I find that that's a place how you can easily do with Hector. You just got to do it the right way. And it's like, like you're not going to be able to really do something like that 
where you have like the extra defense and res and all that sort of stuff just because he, again he's not momity but i think that being able to hinder cooldown charges on your enemy is going to be perfectly fine i think that is a good reasonable middle ground there so i don't know that's just me i just good too i'm out yeah well that's kind of just how it is i mean he's not a super super old uh a legendary unit i mean yes he is but at the same time i mean he's an armor unit so he's gonna have at least 170 bst yeah, i don't know it's just like again i it just makes things a little bit easier to work around with with and it's not like it's not it's not it's not like it's hard to work around hector it's more just that there's a lot more competition for him and the green armor pool at that matter at least even units that do his job better not even just like edelgard like throwing a wrench in what it's like to be an axe armor it just makes it so that he can at least have a little bit more presence in what he needs to do and do that job well and i think that this does it well at least in my opinion all right last up we've got lynn probably the Arguably the worst legendary to have ever released. She has been the weakest legendary. Probably just more so than anybody. She's never been good really at any capacity. So what exactly can be done about her? And I I will admit it feels like a little bit of a kappa, but it feels at the same way. It kind of makes a little bit of sense. And you'll understand why when I get there. Mostly because again, I want to keep these units within the constraints that, hey, they should keep what made them unique at first, you know, unique, but also make things consistent in the game today. So what I have for Swift Mule Gear is effective against flying foes, obviously. Grants for plus three, obviously. The number of allies within two spaces excluding unit is greater than the number of foes within two spaces excluding target. Uh, she'll get plus stack five, or plus five attack and speed uh, during combat, and also inflicts minus attack and five, <laughs> minus attack and speed five on the foe during combat. I forget what exactly it was before, and I'm literally gonna check this right now. Oh, it was just a buff. Okay, so literally all I added was the debuff on the enemy, which I think is fine, and. I want to continue further on before I talk about the whole build as it is, or at least the whole concept, and because you're going to realize what I'm shooting for once I talk about uh, the skill. So, loss of case two. two. If the number of allies within two spaces is greater or equal to two, grants plus four to all stats during combat. If sword, lance, axe, or beast foe initiates combat, unit can counter can counterattack regardless of foe's range. So, first off, I just got rid of the tactics uh restriction again and i think I'll, everybody agreed on this one this just hurt her completely she didn't need this it literally made it so that she had to do some really weird stuff and i think what it was also was that it was also turn-based as well wasn't it or at least phase based if i remember correctly yeah it was a foe initiates combat it's just like why you could have done so many more things. It's just like weird. Oh, wait, no, it was just a foe thing. So maybe I just beat up with the tactics, but you know what? Same difference. But look what I've got here. I have. Well, you know, I'm just going to spoil it. She's basically going to pull a, sp a spendthrift and close foil sort of build here. The well, her swift bully gear is basically pulling an effect similar to spendthrift bow. And she basically has, a, well, literally a close foil at that rate. Uh, and also it's okay too, which I think is honestly okay. I mean, it doesn't make too much, uh, it's not too much of a deviation for her to not be able to attack at close range. I mean, to be fair, she can use a sword and a bow. So I think that's fine with me. Uh, but honestly, I feel like this is okay. Like when it comes to her stats... I mean, you've got her with 31, 36, 21, 27. It's not the best, especially again for somebody who is literally 151 BST and is basically a, well, yeah, she has a Gen 2 Legendary at that rate. So I think it helps out by making her damage output a little bit easier, or at least a little bit nicer. It's not like it's really, she's getting any defense off. It's really just making sure that, you know, she's just getting off 
more consistent doubles at that rate. And I guess she does have a little bit more of a damage output at that rate. I mean, you've got plus four to all stats if Laws of Sakai is up. And then she gets a plus five bonus uh, from Swiss Mule Gear. And then otherwise, the whole speed sort of thing going on. But then she can attack uh, physical units, which I think is okay. Even if her defense isn't the best, it still allows her to do what she can at least sort of do. It just makes her place out a little bit more consistent and a little bit more fluid. You don't have to do some really weird things with her at that rate. Because at this rate, it's like, you don't necessarily have close foil. You have the close foil condition, but not the stats. But if you think about it, you're already getting plus nine uh, defense during your combat, given you have both effects properly working, which in most cases, that should be the case because you are going to want her around her teammates at that rate. That's literally how I'm having her played out here. And I think that works out. And even to, again, further supplement to make sure that she's playing around her teammates and making sure that she has their support. Uh, she can further punish that by having pulse smoke. Uh, I think what I wanted here was that I wanted something a little bit akin to her being, well, a sword master, but also I, I didn't know what it was called and I forget what it is now. Basically just somebody like having a class that's both a uh, sword and bow. I can't remember what it was in Fates, because that's what I was looking at. I forget what it was called there, but you get what I mean, though. I think it was something like a ranger in that regard, but I mean like footlocked, but same sort of thing. I think that making her at least get rid of some cooldown charge on enemies that come at her and that sort of stuff and just punishing them in that regard, especially if they don't die, I think that's fine. And even like nearby enemies at that rate too, just punishing their, uh, their cooldown charge, I think it's still fine. I think it's okay. That's just me. But... Hmm. It should have been better, done better. Oh, I mean, that's kind of just what it was at that rate. And I feel like in a way, there are many different ways to have Lin go because the main point of conversation was, would you rather make her player phase or enemy phase? Because it didn't feel like it really knew where you wanted to go with her. At least it didn't seem like intelligent systems really knew what they wanted to do. And while her stats aren't necessarily the, the best for enemy phase, I think that this still sort of kind of works. I can definitely see where it would make sense to, hey, let's just make her have a lot more player face potential, which it's not like she doesn't necessarily have that. It's just that you have to really play her around her teammates and it's a little bizarre. I think at that rate, and this might be a little bit of a stretch, but if you want to run like a close knit team on ARD, with her she could technically get it to work she would probably be able to get the benefits from all of her uh from all of her skills and still make it work out because it's not like there's any phase restriction either but i, I don't know that's just me and i guess like pulse smoke does work as well deals with specials on uh from anybody who tries to be weird and cheeky on arrow i don't know you know what i mean i want a ranger bow knight yeah no that's the thing like those are all like uh the cavalry ones uh, at least what people have called them in the past, like when it comes to uh, anybody who might have a, a bow and a sword at the same time. I know it's weird, but honestly, I just blame uh, Fire Emblem for not having something like that, at least foot locks, at least that I can remember. But you get what I mean, though. But I get what you are saying, though, when it comes to. Huh. It's going to be weird, though, because even if she has laws of Sakai, that's going to be taken out for. Uh, G Duel Infantry 4, which just came out on Pent. And I don't think there's really anything I can really do about that. Even if I up the uh, the SP cost on that, it just, it won't matter. It's just going to help it out so much more. But I think the main cause for concern there is just, it's not our fault that we have to deal with a legendary unit that has a really weird uh, perf skill that's in their A slots. So it's kind of just like, yeah, I did my best to at least make it into an actual more fitting a skill. But when it comes to if you're going to actually use her in win season to make sure that she can get the best scoring that she possibly can nine times out of 10, unless you really don't care, you're going to be running G2 infantry four. you wanted to get that 175 BST bin and not be stuck at 150 just straight up. So I, I don't know. It, it's weird to really mess with her, but I think that what I at least have for her makes her at least decently unique. I think that, it, again, it's not the best, but 
I think that by making her somewhat unique, at least compared to other legendary archers, when you look at legendary Alm and legendary Leaf, all you really see is their player face potential and what they can do there. No matter what you would do to Lin, she is always going to fall in comparison to Alm and Leaf just because their prowess at player phase is infinitely so much better, especially with their niches. Alm um, just shreds through defense. Leaf can have a brave bow at that rate, an even better one at that rate. So what do you do with Lin at that rate to at least try to make her usable? The best thing, at least in my opinion, might be to try to make her a little bit more enemy phase oriented because we don't have anybody like that right now. So that's why I think these changes could at least somewhat work, at least in the scrub. But that's just me. Oh, well. But what do you guys think about these uh, these propositions, these concepts that I've figured out? If you like them, if you dislike them, feel free to let me know in the comments below. What would you change about any of these? And what are you guys hoping for your concepts? Or what are you hoping for all these remixes going forward? What do you guys think will happen to Gunthra and Ryoma? Uh, the next time I do this video, I'm definitely going to cover Ryoma to make sure that that doesn't... Well, that I at least have a chance to get that done before uh, it finally comes out. Because, frankly, I don't know when that'll happen. But frankly, I don't think anybody really knows when. And I'm actually surprised that they haven't done any more remixes since. It's been like two months since they did the first one. Why is it taking this long for them to uh, throw these out? So I don't know, I'm hoping they get a little bit more consistent with them. And I'm hoping that even if I do make some prides, I might get a little something right. But I don't know. We'll see. But if you liked the video, feel free to leave a comment. Feel free to like the video and subscribe if you want to catch up with more of my videos. And uh, I don't think anybody from the Twitch chat is going to say uh, bye because I don't have chat on. But yeah, from everybody here from Twitch, thanks for stopping by. And uh, thanks to everybody for watching. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.